Gamers that play games on the highest difficulty setting are the top tier in skill, right? But sometimes it's lonely at the top. There's some stuff that only these gamers experience, and that's what we're talking about today. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 things only ultra difficulty gamers will understand. Starting off at number 10, the pain of dying after playing almost perfectly. When you're playing on the hardest difficulties, the margin for error is razor thin. One mistake can equal instant death, and it's something people who play the hardest games will just flat out understand, and it's not really super fun to experience firsthand. There's so many games out there that require near perfection at the highest levels, but one of the standouts is the Devil May Cry series with its hell and hell difficulty. In this mode, if you get hit one time, that's it, you're dead. Enemies, on the other hand, just as tough as they are in any other mode, and in DMC5 at very least, this mode also completely removes checkpoints and disables gold orbs, which is just plain cruel. As you know, combat in DMC, any of them, is lightning fast, so just following the action takes a special kind of awareness, and knowing that just one stray hit can send you all the way back to the start of the level will make even the most hardened gaming madmen sweat bullets. There are a few things out there as miserable as playing a game perfectly, only to lose at the last second to some random attack that you thought you avoided. And it's it's hardly an exclusive feeling to Devil May Cry, but the brutal difficulty modes in that series make it a perfect example for this kind of thing. And number nine is always keep moving. Difficulty is often contradictory in games. You're just expected to play slowly and carefully because you die so quickly, but sometimes the best way to go is just rush forward. Sometimes it makes things easier, like in Mass Effect 2, where rushing forward can sometimes get you past certain triggers. So if you die, you'll just skip past certain encounters, but other games basically make it a necessity to keep moving. Spamming grenades is an annoying enemy habit many Call of Duty campaigns have, but the common consensus is that it's the worst in the World at War campaign. For some cruel reason, Treyarch doesn't really want you to play through the story carefully on veteran difficulty. Like if you stand in one spot for any time longer than a second or two, the game will just start spawning grenades on you just to keep you moving. It's a dick move, to be frank. Half the time you can't even see the enemy throw these things, so they just kind of appear nearby and if you don't start running, you're dead. It's not like the campaign would be easy without the constant grenades raining down on you. No, not at all. Enemies are still pinpoint accurate and can kill you with one or two shots super easy, so the non-stop grenades just make an already brutal difficulty level just that much more difficult. The only way to avoid them is to keep moving, and the only way to survive is to pretty much plan your route exactly. At a certain point, you might as well just be speedrunning the game because that's basically what they expect you to do. And number eight, time is the real enemy. Like, in any game where there's some kind of time management mechanic, usually it's just there to encourage the player to stick to a timeline and continue making progress. And here's the key part, it usually isn't too intrusive. So make the assumption that's a normal difficulty level. <laughs> the hardest difficulty level, on the other hand, that timer goes from being a minor annoyance to the most important thing in the game and a key part of all your decisions going forward. Okay, basically we're talking about XCOM Iron Man Impossible difficulty. Like for many players, making any kind of progress in it is pretty much entirely about time management. Everything you don't like is sped up and everything that you want takes longer. So managing your time becomes an essential resource if you want to keep up with the game. Everything on this difficulty level ties into the issue of time. You want to avoid taking damage at all costs because damaged soldiers equals more injuries, which takes guys out of the action longer and on impossible that can quickly snowball into an unwinnable state. I uh, really any RTS or strategy game. The more difficult things are, the faster you got to get your base built and all your resources set up. When saving time becomes the most important thing in the game, finding every possible way to improve your efficiency is essential. And that's just not an easy feat, especially in a series as difficult as XCOM. That's obviously why we chose it as an example to illustrate our point here, in fact. Here. 
And number seven, on the hardest difficulty, normal keybinds aren't often good enough. Like when you're changing keyboards and controller settings in your games because the standard setup just isn't good enough anymore, that's when you've really gone off the deep end. This sort of thing, uh, like we've seen a lot in multiplayer shooters, but it's similar to playing like very difficult single player games as well. Most of the time I've seen this come up for jumping, like on the harder than hard difficulties. For some games like Doom Eternal, being able to bunny hop effectively can really increase your survivability by a lot. So it's often recommended to swap out the jump controls so that you can more effectively aim while jumping with a controller, usually by changing jump to something unusual like the left stick. There's a lot of other controller tweaks I've seen for various games, but Doom Eternal is a good example because of uh, Ultra Nightmare, you know, the game's hardest difficulty, uh, which is created for people who have taken the limitless pill. Like seriously, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, it's a game that's hard on the standard difficulty, especially if you're using a controller. So for most people, Ultra Nightmare might as well be impossible because that's basically what it is. When the default controls on a game start failing you at the highest levels of play, the only option is reconfiguring them. Often the changes are kind of unconventional, but you gotta take any edge off the game that you can because this stuff can be vicious. And number five, when looking at the enemy as a mistake. It's a classic bullet hell trick that applies to basically any game where you're forced to avoid a lot of projectiles, some shooters, a lot of action games, etc. Um, so if you wanna not get killed, you gotta be laser focused on your ship or your character or whatever you're controlling and not pay that much attention to the enemies or giant boss you're actually fighting. Most of the time, one hit can mean death in these kinds of extreme hard modes. So let's say 98% of the screen is covered in bullets. The only way you're really going to be able to avoid blowing up is to focus entirely on your guy and spend all of your mental energy just trying to figure out how to avoid the literal hundreds of projectiles on the screen at any given moment. Normally in games, your focus has to be on the enemy to some extent, but in a bullet hell, especially a bullet hell in the hardest of hard ultra evil mode, as long as you know where the weak point on the bad guy is, all you really need to do is point in that direction, shoot, and also try to not get hit. So point in that direction, look at your guy, and move away from the bullets. And number four, when your party becomes your worst enemy. Like, in all honesty, it's kind of a rare thing, but when it does show up, it's pretty wild. Like, of course, a lot of co-op games give you the ability to turn friendly fire on and off. Now, on the hardest difficulties, however, it's usually set to on, and that makes your allies into your enemies, unless you really manage to coordinate your team. At least when you're playing with other people, you can communicate with other players to avoid damage, but with certain games that are single player only, that's, it's not possible. Like an infamous example, Dragon Age 2, on its hardest difficulty called Nightmare, makes it so your allies can damage each other with their attacks. Uh, they, this was the standard in Dragon Age Origins, actually, but it feels kind of broken here. Way more attacks hit multiple targets, so you're constantly forced to micromanage your party so they don't hit each other by mistake. And in fact, nearly every fight seems to have multiple waves that just spawn in the middle of the area you fight them in. So that turns every fight into this big mess where everybody's spread out, and it becomes way, way easier to hit your own people by mistake. Nightmare mode in Dragon Age 2 is so annoying that the only explanation is that it wasn't really play tested because nothing about it really makes sense. The fact that friendly fire is so incredibly dangerous is just one of the many problems with this mode. But it is a significant one, and it's not just in this game. It's, this is just a special one. And number three, sometimes the game actually is literally just impossible. Like a ton of games use impossible as a name for their hardest difficulty. And while they're often very hard, they're never actually impossible. But there's a certain set of gamers out there always looking for the next challenge. Like difficulties that developers admit were never tested and are basically designed to be impossible have been beaten, like Doom's nightmare difficulty. But sometimes you get a game where the hardest mode is actually literally impossible, like Penn and Teller's Smoke and Mirrors, a game that weirdly never even got an official release, but includes an impossible difficulty mode that is literally, actually, genuinely impossible. You can't win. Don't try to win. You can't win. If you pick impossible, Lou Reed, Lou Reed, will appear and kill you constantly by shooting lightning from his eyes, saying this. This is the impossible level, boys. Impossible doesn't mean very difficult. Very difficult is winning the Nobel Prize. Impossible is eating the sun. 
And it's like, what? What's Lou Reed doing here? Yeah, it's a joke, but with all the games that claim to have an impossible difficulty, it's interesting to see one that's actually genuinely unbeatable. And also, I know there's a certain segment of you watching this video that are like, challenge accepted. All I have to say to you is enjoy the Lou Reed stuff. And number six, uh, learning to loathe set pieces. Now on the hardest difficulties, the sections of games that most players just breeze right through, set pieces can transform into these brutal game stopping roadblocks. Like anything with a fun set piece, like a turret section or a vehicle part that you would just blaze through on a normal difficulty becomes hellish often when attempted on the hardest difficulty. Like with Uncharted 2 on the hardest difficulty, uh, which is called brutal, one of the best sequences in the game, the train level, becomes an infuriating slog where the game sometimes after dying will just spawn you on top of the train with no cover which basically means instant death or the car section in the original call of Duty. yep basically any car section actually in later games where you die when an enemy looks at you funny and then you have basically no way to fight back the most annoying thing about these kinds of set piece moments is you'll be forced to watch them over and over and over you know from the death and they usually have pretty long non-interactive sections so they become both frustrating and boring at the same time. These moments are usually some of the highlights of the game, but when playing on hard, they're mostly just tedious and annoying and sometimes really unfair. And number two, you just gotta get lucky. Like when you've played enough games in the highest difficulty, one thing you'll learn is to accept luck. Sometimes that's all you can really count on, in fact. For certain games like FTL, for example, no matter how optimized your run is, how perfectly you play, if you don't have a certain amount of good luck, it doesn't even matter. You are going to lose. Halo 4 on Legendary isn't the hardest campaign necessarily, but for a lot of people out there, it does feel like one of the most luck-based, mostly because the annoying teleporting enemy that can be incredibly unpredictable at the worst times, yeah, they're around. This kind of luck-based difficulty is often referred to as a fake challenge because the difficulty isn't really based on how skilled the player is or how well they understand the mechanics. The deciding factor is if they're lucky, and a lot of games on the hardest difficulty have some form of this. And finally, at number one, for the hardest games out there, you're kind of not really playing a game anymore. You're actually kind of just solving it. While searching for examples of hard game things, I ran into a quote on Reddit that kind of perfectly sums up what playing really hard games is about. It was referring specifically to the deity difficulty in Civilization V. An account named Mangafiba said this, Deity isn't so much a game as it is a really specific Civ V puzzle that rewards brain breaking and exploiting the game more than playing it properly. And this kind of sums up the experience of playing games on impossible difficulties. It's not so much about playing the game the intended way, it's about understanding and exploiting the underlying systems. Calling it a puzzle is almost a perfect way of thinking. It can be applied to pretty much any game too, not just strategy games like Civ, because when you're playing a game on the hardest mode, you're not playing it the way developers necessarily want you to play. You're playing to win, and that's by design, sure. But on Legendary, you're not a badass as action hero, you're a tactician methodically dismantling your enemies. You're not playing the game for the experience anymore, you're playing it to challenge yourself and overcome impossible odds. And the only way to do that is to really understand the ins and outs of the game and take advantage of anything you can get, even unintended stuff. It's kind of a totally different way to experience a game, and while some gamers will never really understand why people do it, I think that the quote we mentioned a second ago does a great job explaining why people find this appeal healing. Like, on normal and easy, you're beating a game. You're traversing through a campaign. You're experiencing a set of events, either in a narrative or simply as a sequence of things that you had to complete. There is simultaneously more to it and less to it to play on impossible mode. You've likely seen the story already. You know who dies, who lives, you know which guy turns out to be bad. None of that stuff matters. You're playing the game like you're solving a math problem. Because in some ways, that's actually what you're doing. That's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click a subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. And as always, thank you very much for watching this video. I am Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. And we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.